Hi, it's me, Franklin, and here I am near a turbine. So far in the course, we have spent a ton of time talking about how the machine runs software. We spent a ton of time talking about processes and threads. We spent some time talking about scheduling policies. We've looked at the Linux kernel and how it actually does represent processes, how it gets processes running on the scheduler. We've also taken a look at threading. We've looked specifically in terms of threading at things like locking, how to build a lock, and issues that can come up related to threads and locking. Very specifically, we looked at deadlock. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit. In the later part of this course, we're gonna be spending a lot more time looking at hardware. We're explicitly not looking at how hardware does stuff. Instead, what we're looking at is how the operating system, so how software ultimately needs to work with hardware. We've, we've said that a lot. The operating system and software need hardware support to do certain things. So far, that's been limited to atomic instructions and interrupts. But as we start talking about persistence, and as we start talking about how to manage memory, we're going to need to rely a lot more on hardware support. The first step into looking at hardware support is going to be looking at input and output devices. What we're eventually going to talk about is how to abstractly represent files on a hard drive or on a disk. We're going to be looking eventually at file systems, the data structures that are related to that and the algorithms that are related to that. Before we can get to talking about file systems, we kind of have to go down a few levels and look at how general input and output devices work and then how hard drives specifically work. Knowing how those things work is going to inform how we as an operating system, first of all, build abstractions on top of these devices, but also it's going to inform us about how we design things like file systems. We're gonna start with the general system architecture. This is figure 36.1. In this diagram, we've got a bunch of different components that are all connected to each other. We've got the CPU and memory at the top. The CPU and memory are interconnected with each other over this thing called a memory bus. We've then got a slightly lower level where we've got graphics adapters, so input and output graphics adapters, mostly output for graphics adapters. And these are connected over something called a general I.O. bus. The example given here is PCI. And then at the very lowest level, we've got this peripheral I.O. bus. And attached to the peripheral I.O. bus are things like SCSI, H serial ATA, and USB. These are what I would consider to be input and output devices when I think about them, disks and drives. Everything in this diagram is connected by a bus. A bus is, you know, ultimately a fancy way of saying these things are all connected to each other eventually through wires. Stuff that needs to be really fast is very close to the processor. So in this specific example, memory and graphics, they need to be very fast. They are physically located very close to the processor and the buses in this diagram are physically thicker, and that's because they are going to physically use more wires for interconnections between them. Stuff that's slower is physically farther away from the processor. So SCSI and Serial ATA, these are still inside the computer, but they're physically farther away. They're actually not attached to the motherboard. Things like USB, well, obviously those are fairly far away from the processor in that you, you, you plug stuff into your computer on the outside using this kind of attachment or using this kind of a connection. These lines are thinner, which also implies that there are fewer wires that are physically connecting these devices ultimately to the CPU. 
This is, this is an abstract idea of how computers were probably 20 or so years ago. Modern systems have a slightly more complicated setup. So here's figure 36.2. In the middle, we've got our CPU still, but then on either side of this, we have graphics and memory. Graphics are something that are popular to have on a modern computing system for two reasons, Bitcoin mining or other mining practices and gaming. Both of these are connected to the CPU on a bus, but with very thick connections. There's a lot of wires and a lot of connections that are going between the CPU and these two different kinds of devices. This DMI connection now, this is connecting our CPU to what's called an IO chip. And, and in some kind of way, shape or form, we can actually think of this IO chip as an entire system in and of itself. And this IO chip has different kinds of connections to things like network or disks or other kinds of USB devices. So rather than in figure 36.1, where we've got this big bus that's kind of all, all interconnected with each other, we've got this one central IO chip that's responsible for doing all of this work. On a modern system, we've, we've got all these devices that are interconnected with each other. For now, how they are all interconnected with each other is, is kind of irrelevant. It's not super important for what we need to discuss right now about devices. We also are going to limit ourselves now to like one device. Just taking the time to talk about graphics devices and network devices, keyboards and mice, and drives on top of all of that is going to be really quickly overwhelming. So we're going to limit ourselves specifically to one device. We're going to look at this canonical device that, that looks an awful lot like a hard drive, ultimately, and we're going to limit ourselves to that for now. So let's look at figure 36.3. This is labeled a canonical device. This canonical device is divided into two areas. This thing called the interface and this thing called the internals. This looks an awful lot like what we've been taught about in software design. So build an interface that has the set of operations on this thing that are exposed, and then you've got unimplementation beneath that. The interface that we see here in this figure has registers, so status, command, and data. And we'll take a look at what each of those means soon. But importantly, the interface that's defined by this is not just those registers. The registers are a well-known location to put things, and there are well-known values that we can write to those locations. But the interface here is this combined with a protocol, how you actually interact with those, those different registers, the order that you interact with them, and what you put in those things. The internal structure itself, so the internals half of this canonical device, this looks like a computer in and of itself. It's got a CPU, it's got memory, and it has other hardware specific chips. Part of the hardware specific chips here is going to be ROM, which is memory that is read only. So we've got persistent storage on this device that's separate from what it ultimately is going to read and write from. That ROM has software on it itself, which is often referred to as firmware. It's, device, it's software that's on a hardware device. It's often read-only while the system is running, and it often contains an operating system in and of itself, on modern devices anyway. So as I said, the interface here is defined as this set of registers, but the other half of the interface is the protocol. Let's take a look at figure 36.3, but in the context of the order that we have to actually do things with this device. So we've got these three different register sets. The status registers, this is, what, this is basically how the device tells us what it is doing right now, whether it's busy, whether it's reading, or whether it's writing. We've got the command register, this is where we can tell that device what to do. And we've got the data registers uh, or some kind of a buffer where we can put data. This is how we give information to that device or how we get information from that device.
The protocol that this follows now, so the order in which we interact with each of those registers is defined as first, we have to wait until the device is ready. So we have to do something called polling. This is the very first part of this little pseudocode snippet here. While status is equal to busy, wait until device is not busy. So we're going to spin around and constantly ask this device, are you ready for me to write data? Are you ready for me to tell you what to do? Once polling has completed, and that means that the device's status has changed to something other than busy, at that point, we write data, the data that we want to send to this device, to the data register or to the data buffers. After we have finished writing the data to that buffer or register, then we write to the command register and we say, hey, this is what I want you to do with this data. As soon as we finish writing to that command register, the device is going to start doing what we've asked it to do. So it's going to take the data that we've put in the data register and it's going to start writing it to wherever we've told it to write it to. And finally, our job now is to wait until the device tells us that it has finished doing what we ask it to do. So we start doing polling again. In its entirety, this little snippet of pseudocode is called programmed I.O. We explicitly wait for the device to be ready. We explicitly encode, write data to the device. So there are instructions that are being executed that are transferring from main memory into the data register for this device. We explicitly tell it what to do, and then we explicitly wait for it to tell us when it has finished by constantly asking it, are you done yet? This, this looks an awful lot like something else we've seen before, specifically this polling idea. And what we, when we saw that before, we recognized it as kind of a total waste of time. It's still a total waste of time. Basically because we've got our OS and our CPU sitting around running instructions that are constantly asking this device, are you ready yet? This is a total waste of time. So maybe there's something else that we can do about it. Let's look at the problem specifically though. Here's a diagram that shows over time, given this pseudocode that we just looked at, what the CPU is doing and what our disk is doing. On the left, for the first little bit, we're running, we're running instructions for process one or task one. After a certain point, task one conducts a system call where it's going to do some kind of I.O. At that point, we have to switch to polling and waiting around for the, for the disk or for the drive or for that I.O. device to be ready. So this block of gray squares is labeled as P. We're doing polling here. After the polling has completed, after the task that we've asked that I.O. device to do is done, then we switch back to the CPU and task one runs on the CPU again. So this entire block of time has been spent running instructions from task one or doing polling on behalf of task one while task one stuff is being read or written to the IO device that we're using. You remember a long time ago when we talked about direct execution where we had this problem of needing to regain control of the processor. And the solution that we had for that was, well, let's just have this timer thing fire every once in a while, interrupt what was running on the CPU and let the operating system regain control. That was a really good idea. Maybe it's a good idea for this too. It turns out it's a great idea. This is a good solution to this problem, having interrupts. The difference between what we did before with the timer interrupts and what we're doing now with polling is that we don't want this just, just to fire periodically. We don't want this device, this timer to say every once in a while, okay, you take over again. Instead, what we want is this device to notify us, to send us a signal when it is finished what we've asked it to do. What we really want to be able to do is not poll. 
We want to avoid wasting those cycles pulling, waiting around for this device to finish doing stuff. Let's take a look at a different diagram here. We still have task one, but now we also have task two in this. At the very left side of this diagram, we're starting executing instructions from task one, but instead of doing polling, once we've set up this set of registers on this IO device for task one's IO request, we don't wait, we don't pull, we don't pull. Instead, we switch to another task. Here we're switching to task two. And then after a few cycles of time, after a few units of time, that IO device interrupts. It sends this interrupt, it fires this interrupt, the OS regains control and it can switch back to task one and allow task one to continue executing after that IO request has completed. This is really great. This is really great now because we're not wasting time polling. We're allowing some other task that the system has to actually make meaningful progress towards doing what it's supposed to do. We can get a little bit of work done for task two while task one can't do anything. This is, this is great, this is really good. <laughs> but there's a problem. Oh, there's always a problem, but there's a problem. The problem might be that this IO device that we have might be able to satisfy this request incredibly quickly. There are two possible reasons for this. One, the IO device is just super fast. If the IO device is super fast, we've got some NVMe SSD. It's able to go super, super fast compared to a spinning rust disk or We've got just a really small IO request. We're not actually asking for that much data to be read from or written to this device. In that case, we're actually gonna spend more time possibly doing context switching between task one and task two than we would actually making any meaningful progress on the other task that we tried to schedule. The solution that we have for this is possibly to do a two-phased approach. Instead of just immediately trying to switch to task two, one solution that we could do is pull for a small period of time after we send off this IO request. If it's a really quick request, then the device might get back to us before this small time period of polling is over and we never do a context switch. If it's a long IO request, then we can stop polling after some certain amount of time and then do the context switch. This will help us avoid making some context switch again, where we couldn't actually make that much progress on the other task compared to the cost of context switching itself. Another possibility is that we can have events just happening really, really quickly. So a good example of this is network IO with packets being sent to our device. If we've got many, many packets being sent to us and they're being received constantly by our networking card, if our networking card is constantly firing interrupts, our operating system might be spending way more time trying to handle those interrupts than actually being able to do anything else. So we'll constantly get interrupted and the OS will take over trying to handle a packet and then constantly get interrupted again and again and again. It's a similar problem to context switching really rapidly between a process and not being able to make any meaningful progress in it, but the difference is we're spending all the time in the OS trying to handle those interrupts. One strategy that we can rely on hardware to help us out here is for the hardware to coalesce the interrupts. So coalesce here means bring together. Instead of firing an interrupt on every single packet, maybe the hardware will fire an interrupt on every thousand packets. It's got its own internal memory and it's able to keep them the operating system will then do all 1000 at the same time. Interrupts are a good way for us to improve performance in terms of being able to make meaningful progress while IO is being satisfied by this external device. We're able to make some meaningful progress on some other task while we're waiting for the IO request to complete. This is good, but we can make it better. Let's look back at the pseudocode that we have. We've got polling. We've solved that problem with interrupts. We've got write data to the data register, and we've got write command to the command register. Write data to the data register. We're going to be limited to how big the data register is or how big the data buffer is. 
if the data buffer or the data register is, is one byte and we need to make a transfer of one gigabyte between memory and this IO device, then we're going to have to have instructions in our OS code to actually do that. We're gonna to have to have load and, and, and out instructions constantly being executed by our CPU on behalf of our operating system. Let's look at another figure showing a timeline here. At the start here, we've got task one being executed. And then a part way through task one's execution, we've got these gray blocks that are labeled C. Here is where the operating system is having to execute instructions that are setting data into that data register. Once we've done that, after we have finished that, then we can switch to task two. So we can do the context switching then, but only after the OS has had the responsibility of doing that. We can actually solve this problem by adding another CPU to the system. Okay, great, you might be saying, of course, let's just speed it up by throwing more hardware at the problem. Yeah, this is not like a super ideal solution, but the CPU that we're adding to this system is cheap and it's not general purpose. Instead, the CPU that we wanna to add to this system has exactly one purpose and its purpose is to do the transfer of data between memory and the, the IO device that we're talking about. It explicitly has only this purpose and this is called a DMA controller. The idea is that we want to give access to this external CPU, this external processor, this external DMA controller. We want it to have access to both memory and the I.O. device that we're looking at. And we want to basically be able to tell it, we want our CPU to be able to tell this DMA controller, we want the OS to be able to tell this DMA controller here. Please transfer this data between memory and our I.O. device. I'm going to do other stuff while you're doing that. Let's take a look at one last figure here. You're showing a timeline. We've got task one on the left side. It's starting again. Eventually then we write to the DMA controller. The DMA controller is going to have the responsibility of actually conducting the transfer. And the CPU now can do context switching. Our OS can context switch to task two and immediately start running task two instead of having to do this transfer on behalf of task one. Eventually, the disk will do what it needs to do for task one while we're executing for task two, and then we'll do an interrupt and a context switch back to task one at the very end. Huh. Okay, so this, this is great. It just keeps getting better. We can theoretically transfer data between our CPU using our OS. We can tr theoretically transfer data between our memory and this IO device by having our operating system coordinate the whole thing. But how do we do it in practice? How do we actually do this? How do we run instructions that are going to actually make these transfers happen? There's two options that we have for this. One is instructions in our assembly language. This is hardware support specifically for the instruction set architecture provided by the instruction set architecture. On x86, for example, there are two hardware instructions that we can run to transfer information between the CPU or between memory and the IO device that we want to interact with. And this is called in and out. These instructions are privileged, meaning that, think all the way back to our direct execution, we've got these different modes that our CPU can execute in. These instructions can only be executed by the operating system. Now think about that for a second. Why would we only want the CPU to run these instructions? We don't really want user processes being able to read and write directly from something like a disk. We really do not want that to happen because we, we as an operating system, first of all, need to enforce things like permissions on files, but also as an operating system, and we're gonna get to this eventually, as an operating system, we maintain certain data structures on these disks. 
We do not want user processes interfering with and corrupting those data structures at runtime. So these instructions must be privileged. We cannot allow user processes to run them. The other option that we have for conducting I.O. in practice is something called memory mapped I.O. You may have seen this in Comp 2280 if you've taken that path through the computer science department. The basic idea with memory mapped I.O. is that we steal addresses. Instead of having all of memory being general access and general purpose, we take certain addresses and we say, this address corresponds to this register on the I.O. device. So I'm going to say something like address FFFFF7 is the status register on this device. If I try to read from or write to the status register, it will not actually read or write from memory locations, but instead it will be redirected to that I.O. device that we have attached to this system. Picking one or the other of these, it's not really important for us. It's actually more related to the hardware that you're working with that dictates which one you choose. But neither one nor the other is, is better or worse. An example for what it's worth of memory mapped I.O. is on the Game Boy Advance. Certain registers on the Game Boy Advance and certain parts of the hardware on the Game Boy Advance are memory mapped to certain regions of, of memory. So reading and writing from those locations will not read or write memory, but instead will write certain registers or different parts or physically different pieces of memory. That, that is going to let us actually send data and get data from IO devices. We've got assembly language instructions that are explicitly for input and output, in and out, or we have the ability to do loads and stores on memory locations in our memory and have that read and write from this device. That is great, that's amazing. But we just said that these instructions are privileged. We can't allow user space programs to run in and out because we need as an operating system to maintain permissions on things like files. We need to maintain integrity on the file system. We, we have to be able to use those devices. Ultimately, we have to be able to have an implementation for this interface such that a user program can ultimately do things like open and read and write. When we look at this, we're gonna look at this from the perspective of abstraction. We've got drives. Let's focus on input and output devices that are drives. All drives have the same general purpose. I wanna put files on them and I wanna read files from them. In that all of these drives have the same general purpose, I want to be able to abstract those common operations. I should not have to care about what kind of drive, what brand name it is, how it's attached to the system, what type it is once it is attached to the system, whether it's a disk or an SSD. I, I don't care. I don't want to care as a user. I want to be able to open a file and read from it or write to it. That's what I ultimately want to be able to do. In terms of our operating system, we need to be able to logically represent the way that these files and folders are structured on our system. We need to be able to take this drive and be able to just put data on it. Again, I want to be able to organize this, organize this logically with something like a file system, but I don't want to have to care about how the disk physically represents that. So we need to have some kind of abstractions to help us represent that. Let's take a look at figure 36.4. 36.4, figure 36.4 is showing us several different interfaces and several different implementations of that interface. And the general structure here is showing us what the Linux kernel or the, how the Linux kernel itself is architectured. The gray sections that we have here are explicitly interfaces. The parts that are in between and outside of those gray sections are implementations. At the very top here, we've got an application. This is your code that you've written that's running in the user space. Your code targets an interface. 
The interface that your code targets is what's called the POSIX API. You have probably seen POSIX listed in manual pages. You may have heard me use the term POSIX in class. But the POSIX API is what defines function calls and signatures like open and read and write. This is the interface that our programs are targeting. The POSIX API, implementations of the POSIX API are the file systems that we have in our operating system. Windows has a few different implementations of file systems like FAT32 or all of the FAT suite of implementations and NTFS. Those are the two major implementations of the file system. They're not POSIX, but they're an implementation of a file system. On Linux, we've got many, many different implementations of this POSIX API. We've got things like the EXT suite, so EXT2, EXT3, EXT4. We've got BetterFS, BTRFS. We've got ZFS, which is wildly different than that, but that's okay, it still implements the POSIX API. There are many, many, many different implementations of this POSIX API on the Linux side. The Linux side also provides raw access to disk. The raw access to disk is still going to be run by privileged instructions, but it gives us very granular access to that. It's explicitly for things like file system checkers. So code that you launch, you start a file system checker that checks the integrity of the file system from user space, but that program actually needs raw access to our disk so that it can do things like check the integrity of the data structures that the file system has. Beneath the file system, the file system itself does not target disks specifically, but instead file systems target another interface. The interface that disks target here is the generic block interface. The generic block interface has even more primitive read and write, block read and write. A block in short is a blob of bytes that has a certain size. Usually it corresponds to what a sector size is on a disk, which you'll see in the next chapter. So usually it's like 512 bytes or 4096K. The generic block interface really just has this read and write. The implementation of the generic block interface then is going to be this generic block layer the generic block layer targets another interface, which is a specific block interface, which is protocol specific read and write. At that point, we get down to the bottom of this hierarchy. And at the bottom of this hierarchy is code that is device drivers. This is software. This is an implementation that's written to target a specific piece of hardware, the NVMe SSD that you have the IDE disk that you have attached to your really, really old computer at home, or the serial ATA disk that you have inside your computer now, or the USB drive that you plug into the side of it. In, in terms of software design, and this is not a software design course, in terms of software design, nevertheless, between these different layers and between these different interfaces, we ought to be able to just switch out willy-nilly the implementation. I should be able to take a drive out and put a different drive in, and it shouldn't have any effect on the layers that are above it. I should be able to switch out this generic block layer implementation, and it shouldn't have any effect on how the file system works or is implemented. I should be able to change the file system implementation, and it shouldn't change how the user space code, your code, actually works. In terms of software design, that is an excellent design. The one problem with this, and this problem is true for any software design that follows this kind of pattern, if the implementation has more features than the interface exposes, then we can't really use those things. Think about this in terms of like Java interfaces and superclasses and subclasses. This is kind of where we have to go through this approach of casting types. We have to cast to a more specific subclass to be able to use the methods on that subclass. If we use the superclass interface, we can only call the methods that are on the superclass interface. So you can kind of think of these interfaces as literal Java interfaces 
and the implementations as classes that implement those. This is, this is almost like encapsulation, except we're not talking about objects. And because it's almost like encapsulation, it has the same problems as encapsulation. A couple of things to note about this diagram is that the amount of code in the operating system increases as you move down this diagram. So applications, okay, well, there's a lot of application code, but that's not really part of the operating system. There are a bunch of file systems, sure, but the code that's there is tiny. It's minuscule compared to the number of lines of code that are device drivers that are in an operating system. The statistic that our textbook cites is that 70% of the Linux kernel is device drivers, but the reference that they're making is from a publication that's almost 20 years old at this point. If that's still true, if that 70% is still true, and I'm willing to bet that it is, as of 2020, the Linux kernel had 27.8 million lines of code. 70% of that, if that statistic is still true, is about 20 million or 19 million lines of code. So 19 million lines of code are just device drivers in the Linux kernel in our operating system. They're not all block device drivers, but they're device drivers nevertheless. So this is all great in theory. We've, we've moved a little bit closer to actually realizing how to do this, but we're still just looking at this all sort of in theory. We've looked at software design, interfaces, implementation. We've talked about instructions or memory mapped IO that we can actually use to do this IO, but it's still kind of abstract. There's still no hard drive that we can actually touch here. So let, let's take an actual look at a, a case study. This case study is going to look at an IDE drive, which it's, it's old, but it's functional, and it's gonna give us the idea that we need for how this works. Remember that there's two parts of the interface for our IDE drive or for our IO device. The first part of the interface is the set of registers. Here's the protocol. First, we wait for the device to be ready. And this is the same as the polling that we saw before in our pseudocode. We constantly read the status register until the drive reports itself as ready. Once the drive reports itself as ready, then we start writing parameters to command registers. So this is us basically passing arguments to this function by telling this drive where you should do stuff, where you should write the data that we're asking you to write, how much of it we're asking you to write, that sort of thing. Then we start the I.O. by writing to a specific command register that's going to initiate the I.O. After that, we do this data transfer. So for writes, we're waiting until the status is ready, and then we're gonna write to the data port. And then at that point, our job as the operating system is to back off and wait for interrupts. The drive will signal to us that it is finished doing what we've asked it to do. And for each of those signals, we're going to have to do this error handling. So we're gonna check to see if the status register is like error or success, and if it's an error, we're going to check to see what that error was so that we can report it back to our user program. Let's look at a little bit of code. This is figure 36.6. This is a sample of code from XV6, which is a, a, a teaching and learning operating system. This is a simplified version of this code. In terms of what this does, it matches the protocol fairly closely. So at the top, we've got this function static int IDE wait ready. It reads this specific register to check to see what the status of that drive is. So it's constantly asking, are you ready or not? And it's literally just this loop that does nothing. Gee, that looks familiar. Then we've got IDE start request. So this is the second function. We've got this buffer that we're taking in and this is going to be the data that we're ultimately going to write and we start writing to locations in memory. So out B is a function that is ultimately going to run the out, out instruction probably. This IDE start request function is the one that's actually responsible for writing to the disk or actually responsible for asking the disk to write some data to itself. The IDE RW function is going to be responsible for starting to coordinate all of this. So you can see here that it's using some cues to deal with I.O. requests that are coming from the user space. The IDE interrupt function here at the bottom finally is going to handle the interrupts that the, that the drive is sending back to us. 
you, you don't have to understand exactly what this code is doing. The last little bit of this is talking about the historical motivation for some of these solutions. Historically, some of the things that we've been looking at, they're pretty old. They go back pretty much all the way to the beginning of, of what we know as modern computing. Ideas like DMA and interrupt go all the way back to the 50s, basically. So in summary, this, this chapter is very much about, one, how do you do I.O.? Two, how do you make I.O. go faster? And our solutions there were interrupts and DMA. And then finally, more of a software design approach. How do you first of all physically separate the interface and the implementation of a hardware device? But then how do you separate the interface and implementation for how you want your users from the operating systems perspective to interact with those devices? So having things like the POSIX APA, API, having things like the POSIX API, and having file systems that implement that POSIX API, and then all the way down to device drivers. That's it for our introduction to IO devices. Thanks for listening and I'll, I'll see you all soon.